All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming out today. Uh, I also want to point out that this is actually a joint uh, meetup with the Ann Arbor, our A2 ML group. Liz Dan Pressel, who runs that group. How you doing? Do you want to make an announcement about? Um, sure, yeah. If you guys are interested in machine learning and you're not already part of the machine learning meetup, but you're part of PyData, I definitely recommend joining. Um, we talk about this kind of stuff. It's a regular thing. So, um, what's that, Chuck? Speak up. Okay, everybody. Oh, oh okay. Um, so, yeah, join the Ann Arbor Machine Learning Meetup if you haven't joined it already. Also, we have a community wide Slack called a2mads.slack, whatever. Um, there's a self sign up. So if you sign up for the machine learning meetup, then you'll get a, a and as part of the welcome email, you'll get the self sign on link for that as well. If somebody needs it and doesn't have it already, for some reason, just catch up with me afterwards. Awesome. So a couple of things, obviously acknowledgements. We'd like to acknowledge NumFocus, uh, for sponsoring this, uh, the, the meetup group itself. TD Ameritrade for, for sponsoring not only, not only their, our time, but also the space that you're uh, inhabiting. Also Spark for helping out, and also Midas. Midas is a, is a great resource that is uh, sponsoring the food here. So make sure that you see some uh, University of Michigan people, say, say thank you. All right. And also another great thing too is, uh, as a Pi Data Ann Arbor group, we have recently eclipsed over 500 members of our group in a short six months, which is fantastic. Uh, it helps to justify in the, in the long term uh, running a Pi Data conference here in Ann Arbor, which I hopefully people will sign up and, and, and take part in. And also even for this, for this particular meetup, we think we had combined about 160 people register for this event. So thank you again for your continued interest and support. Uh, also, again, for people that are New here, this is the standard preamble. Emergency exits, there's one right here, and there's one right outside the, the door to your right. Okay, so if anything happens, uh, please use the stairs. Uh, again, we're always looking for speakers. So if you, you're you local, uh, you work for a company, work at the university, come tell us and share your data story. It doesn't always have to be data success. Even failure is good for us to learn from. Uh, workshops, Marcus is still working on, on putting together a workshop for us, but if you have any feedback, uh, in general, whether it's about workshops, about uh, how we are organizing this event, how we can improve and be better, please definitely reach out to us. Also, everything that we do uh, is stored on our GitHub page, so go and check that out. Um, and unless you have quick, short questions, please try to hold them at the end um, so that uh, we can get through our talk quickly. And again, we're in a borrowed space, so please be respectful and clean up after yourselves. So all of your, your plates and your cups, please help out. Uh, as always, I'd like to read the PyData Code of Conduct, especially for our, our new uh, members here. So PyData is dedicated to providing a harassment-free meeting experience for everyone, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, disability, physical appearance, body size, race or religion. We do not tolerate harassment of, of meeting participants in any form. All communication should be appropriate for a professional audience, including people of many different backgrounds. Sexual language and imagery is not appropriate for any of our meetup events. Be kind to others, do not insult or put down other attendees, behave professionally, Remem remember that harassment and sexist, racist, or exclusionary jokes are not appropriate for Pi Data. Attendees violating these rules may be asked to leave, uh, by the, uh, leave the meetup at the sole discretion of the meetup organizers. But overall, it's just thank you for making this a welcoming and friendly event for everybody. I assume that everybody will, be, will, will do good. Um, again, we'd like to do a, a quick icebreaker because at these events, it's good for networking. So today's icebreaker is turn to one of your neighbors, introduce yourself, and tell them what you're listening to, either music, podcasts, anything audio. So turn to your neighbor and share. Please, go ahead. So what are you listening to? On I, 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 I am listening to kids music with my son in the car. Do you ever play Tolkien Six? Yeah, but I need like uh, in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why, but the door doesn't. It's closed, but there's like a wind gap and it's just so loud. All but once you get paid the big bucks, you get a big car. I honestly want. I, 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 
have, but <laughs> no, I, I'm just waiting. I don't want to get a good car in Michigan winter. It's coming with all the garages. So maybe a convertible. Sure, sure. When I'm in California, maybe. That was not recorded, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, uh, of course, we'd like to mention our sort of uh, data science uh, story of the month. So, as you all may or may not know, uh, there was recently Pi Data Seattle, uh, but there is upcoming uh, Pi Data New York City, which uh, TD Ameritrade happens to be one of the diamond sponsors for. But it's uh, November 27th to 30th. Go sign up, uh, limited spots, and they're going to fill up really, really quickly. And it's the Monday after Thanksgiving, in case that matters. So go check it out. Also, uh, we'd like to remind people that uh, O'Reilly is generous enough to offer one of these free ebooks that you can go download. If you visit this link up here, O'Reilly.com slash pub slash get Pi Data Ann Arbor, you can give, provide your email address and they'll send you uh, or they'll give you access to one of these books. Again, uh, this is on our GitHub page at uh, PyData Ann Arbor, so don't be don't be concerned about missing. And also, always tweet at us at PyData Ann Arbor, or you can find us on uh, on Gmail. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, TD Ameritrade is hiring. Uh, if I can have the analytics COE people, part of the uh, TD Ameritrade, please put up a hand or something so people can see you. Maybe in the back. So visit one of one of these these folks here. Their team is hiring, whether it's data scientists, data analysts, make sure you talk to them, right? Also on the advanced analytics team here in Ann Arbor, uh, they're in the back there, they're also hiring, I think, a Java, Java developer. And also on my team, on the advanced technology team, we're looking for uh, senior folks on the research and development side. And a separate announcement for uh, StockX, Vu over here, uh, if you want to talk to him. Uh, I think it's based out of Detroit. Yeah, we're in the downtown Detroit. So they're hiring a, a group of people from a VP of data, data science, data analysts, BI analysts, uh, product catalog specialists, and data engineers. And here's some of the information. So Bilaha? Blah. Blaha. Blah. And, and Vu at uh, StockX.com. But again, you can find this on, on our GitHub page, which, which we'll post afterwards. And any other, anybody else have a job posting that they would, they would like to share? If you don't have it now, you can always reach out to me and I'll, and I'll add it to our, our deck in the future. And of course, the next event is with Brian Witherspoon from Duo Security, so somebody local here. And it, the title of their talk is Biggish Data, Scaling Up Customer-Facing Logs. And it's uh, not too far away, Thursday, September 14th, same time, same place. And so with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker of today. So this is uh, Sebastian Rashka from Michigan State University. Uh, right now, so you might have you might know Sebastian from uh, from being a Amazon best-selling author. Is that correct? Oh, uh, for, <laughs> for, <laughs> for uh, his uh, book on machine learning and Python, uh, and the second edition is about to come out. But also, Sebastian currently is uh, a senior graduate student at Michigan State University, and he was recently earlier in the year uh, won an award for the uh, biochemistry department as I guess graduate student of the year of the years, I should say. And being a, a former a graduate of that same department, it is not uh, uh, it is not awarded every year. So this is a, a, a huge accomplishment. And amongst amongst those accomplishments, you, you will probably have seen a lot of great things that Sebastian has done. And we're very fortunate that he's here today uh, to talk about TensorFlow. So would you mind all giving uh, Sebastian a round of applause? Everybody, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hi everyone. Thank you for attending and thanks for the nice introduction, Sean. He was actually in the same department as I was, but I think he left a few e years earlier before I started. Uh, but I saw some posters uh, in the hallway mentioning his name. <laughs> and um, yeah, thanks for coming and I hope uh, my talk won't be as long as Sean's, but I think uh, maybe something <laughs> interesting to present here. Honestly, I've never given a talk on TensorFlow, and I should mention I don't want to over-advertise anything, but I found it very useful in one of my recent projects. I'm collaborating with a biometrics uh, group at MSU, where we uh, work on also computation, uh, uh, computer vision problems, and I found it incredibly useful for that project, where we built our own kind of neural network architectures. And by, with that, I'd just like to introduce it to you, because, you know, 
deep learning is kind of a hype or maybe over hype right now. And this is just a little tool that helps you to make use of um, this technology of deep learning, maybe applying it to your projects. And with that, maybe uh, let me start. And um, so there will be a kind of, I mean, I try to not include too many code snippets because it's not really like a hands-on tutorial where we execute code and stuff like that. Uh, but there will be some code snippets. So I put a, a Jupyter notebook here on GitHub that if you like to check out the code, if you want to revisit things later, it's all on there. And also the slides are on speaker deck. Just uploaded them, I think, yesterday sometime uh, in the evening. And um, yeah, so then let's just start talking uh, about TensorFlow. I'm not sure how many people have used TensorFlow here. Oh, quite a bit. I uh, hope it won't be too introductory then. So TensorFlow, for those who haven't used it yet, uh, is uh, basically a, a library that helps you to perform uh, linear algebra operations like matrix multiplications, but it has also a lot of things that uh, help you with deep learning, like uh, predefined functions, wrapper functions that make everything a little bit more convenient. It has been uh, open sourced in November 2015. It's not in my uh, book, which was just published like a few months earlier, where I still used Theano, which I also found useful. And the reason why I use TensorFlow is mainly, uh, I, I think it was Christmas break, I needed some something to play with, I checked it out, I really liked it, and I used it then in my future projects. And yeah, that is uh, the white paper with a lot of information uh, about why TensorFlow, how they build it, and all the kind of details. Uh, it evolved quite a bit though, it's 2017 now, and it's uh, version 1.3 now, so it's a lot more mature now than it was back then. And also there are a lot of uh, contributions from the open source community, improving it, making it faster, adding new features. It's a pretty uh, cool project, or it has become a really big project as well. And um, yeah, maybe just to start with the name TensorFlow, why tensors, or what are tensors? So the name TensorFlow, it kind of indicates tensors are like a mathematical object uh, to represent uh, scalars, vectors, matrices. It's a generalization of the term, for example, we can say a uh, scalar single number would be a rank one, a uh, rank zero tensor, a vector a rank one tensor, matrix a rank two tensor. And if we stack multiple matrices, that would be a rank three tensor. We usually in practice use terms like matrices and vectors and say tensor if we have anything that is has more dimensions than a matrix because we don't have a special term for that anymore. And um, yeah, so, and you can also think about it if it sounds fancy, tensors and stuff, but I mean, if you've used NumPy, the multidimensional arrays, it's exactly the same thing. So multidimensional arrays are basically data structures to represent tensors, the mathematical objects. And um, just quickly, uh, installing TensorFlow, because there's something I want to get at in a second. So it's a pretty uh, empty slide, which maybe indicates it's pretty easy to install. It's maybe not the whole truth, so on my laptop, for example, I just pip install TensorFlow. I have the CPU version. It works perfectly fine. I run the code on my laptop to debug code, to develop code. But ultimately, we want to run stuff on the GPU. And um, there you can also then install the GPU version. And um, that takes a little bit more of a setup regarding uh, other libraries by NVIDIA, like CUDA and QDNN. Um, but there's a good guide out there uh, on the tensorflow.org install. I also have put together a PDF on how to set it up on uh, Amazon. I personally, I sometimes use uh, Amazon if I run Jupyter Notebooks. But usually we have the HPCC at MSU, which I just, where I just uh, prototype my code on my laptop and then submit it via PBS script to the HPCC. And the nice, nice thing about TensorFlow is you don't have to do anything, anything extra to run your code on a GPU or CPU. It's basically you just submit your script and it will run. And the cool thing about GPUs then is uh, why do we care about GPUs? Because for operations that can be uh, easily parallelized, it's a lot faster. And here's just a, chart or a table I put together like a few weeks ago. And uh, maybe it's a little bit unfair because I took a high-end, uh, very expensive CPU. But usually you can see at a, let's say, a similar price point, in general, you get a lot of more performance out of the GPU if you have operations that support it, for example, uh, linear algebra uh, operations and things like that. 
And one of these things would be, for example, just a matrix multiplication. So to talk a little bit about vectorization, when we write, let's say, deep learning application or machine learning, we try to vectorize our code. So that means that we want to uh, take advantage of um, operations that can be run in parallel, removing for loops and things like that. So if you think about it, if you have these two matrices, for example, here that uh, in the rows that could be your training examples in the columns that could could be your features and then you multiply it by a matrix then this first row here if you multiply it with this one it's basically just a multiplication of each element you multiply this one with this one this one and this one this one and this one and then if you've done this um, five times you uh, compute the sum of these uh, terms and then you get this value here and you don't have to wait um, till this finishes when you compute the next column to get this value for example, with the first row, you can run this in parallel. You can take advantage that this is kind of an independent operation. And CPUs are also pretty good at that. There's the SIMD, the uh, single instruction multiple data thing uh, in G uh, CPUs, but GPUs are really even much better at that. And just to show you an example, uh, to get back to vectorization, uh, matrix, uh, matrix multiplication, I can also write it out in uh, Python here. Like, uh, I have actually three for loops. I loop over the training examples. Let's say I uh, want to compute activations for a hidden layer. I have a weight matrix that is n features times uh, n hidden, or a number of hidden units. And I could just write this for loop, uh, iterate over the training examples in the columns of my weight matrix. And then for the ve vector dot product, I would compute, uh, or I have another for loop. And we can just do this simply with one operation using linear algebra by computing the uh, matrix multiplication using, for example, here NumPy would give the exact same result. And um, so we can do this on NumPy, but with TensorFlow, it's even more efficient because we can take advantage of GPUs, which is especially useful if we have uh, deep neural networks. And uh, to get back to TensorFlow now, so TensorFlow has these uh, computation graphs, and this is a screenshot uh, from, or a figure from the paper, actually. And to maybe explain for those who haven't used uh, TensorFlow yet, to kind of introduce how we think uh, we have to think about computation graphs when we write our code. It's a little bit different from native Python and NumPy. So um, in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about computation graphs now. So how we, what that means and how we work with them. So let's say we have a simple function uh, that could be, let's say, an activation function. Uh, we have um, multiplication here, like let's say a weight times a feature from a training sample plus a bias unit and a ReLU activation function. It's just a very, very simple function. Could be one uh, hidden activation in our neural network. And for those who haven't uh, worked with ReLUs, that's just a rectified linear unit that looks like this. So what it just basically means is if our input is uh, larger than zero, it is returning the input, it's like an identity function. If it's uh, zero, the uh, output is zero. So it basically looks like that. Um, yeah, and then uh, if we have such a function, uh, here I just group these terms together, call it u and uh, v. We can represent that as a computation graph. For example, if we would draw a computation graph of this equation, it would look like this. So we have, again, we have uh, different nodes here. The nodes can be our data points or let's say here scalars or rank zero tensors and then the operations are also nodes in the graph and then if we multiply these two we get u it's one thing in our computation graph then here we add the bias we get a v which is u plus b and then we put it through the relu function to get a base of the activation so that would be the same function that we have here uh, represented as a computation graph and in TensorFlow, if we want to, let's say, define a computation graph, uh, what we do is there's always a default graph in the background that we can add uh, nodes to. But I prefer usually to use it or to do it explicitly to define a new graph, use it as the, as the default graph, and then add operations and uh, tensors to it. And there are also two kinds of things in uh, TensorFlow where we could to put data in. First, um, there's the placeholder. You can see we don't put any value here. We just give it a shape. If we put shape none, that means basically rank zero, a scalar. 
but we don't put any number in here because the number uh, will be fed to the graph when we execute the graph. So there are in TensorFlow two steps, defining a graph and running a graph with an, to run an actual computation. And if we just also define this graph, it won't allocate any memory for the graph if we have, a, let's say, a large uh, matrix, let's say uh, 1,000 times 1,000 elements. This matrix doesn't get, or the memory for this matrix doesn't allo get allocated until we initialize variables. And variables here, variables in the graph are things uh, when we have, a, let's say, a neural network and we have a weight parameter or weight matrix. These are the ones that we want to change, something that we want to uh, modify. So placeholders are more like uh, data that we feed into, that could be our in input data, and variables are the things that we want to tune or optimize. And uh, these var uh, variables have to be initialized when we run the graph, so we can, uh, I just put it here, a global variables initializer, we will use it later, that will uh, initialize variables and allocate the memory for it. And just to show you, if I would just uh, run this print thing, it won't print any numbers, it won't print the number two and one here, it will just show us some definitions here of our tensors. So by that, I just want to um, kind of show you that it's not really running anything, any computation, or it's just a definition of a graph. And uh, to actually run the graph, we use a session. So we feed our graph to a TensorFlow session here and initialize the variables. And when we do a session.run, we can fetch things from the graph. And here, B doesn't have any dependencies. We can fetch the value of B uh, via the session.run here and get the one back that we uh, set earlier as the initial value for our variable B. And the thing is here, uh, I put it as a string here, but you could also easily say, uh, if I go back one slide, you can easily put the variable name B here. But what happened to me in my projects is often that I don't know, by accident, I have uh, multiple Bs, for example. Let's say I have a Python variable B also, another one, and then it becomes really confusing. So what I usually prefer to do, I give my um, uh, nodes names, for example, here B, and then I use the name that is there in the graph to be really uh, explicit that this is a thing from the graph here. And the colon uh, zero, that, um, so what you can have is you can have multiple Bs in a graph, and here, in this case, I only have one B, so it's the zero, zero uh, let's say B0. And uh, so you can have, let's say, B1, B2, and things like that. So you, here you can just ignore it. It's just like, let's say, like a counter or something like that. And yeah, so you can also, what, what is also pretty cool about it is um, what I found useful to kind of debug my uh, neural networks is a tensor board. It has to be installed um, explicitly. You have to call pip install tensor board. But what it uh, lets you do is it lets you monitor, uh, let's say, weight parameters uh, during training, the cost function. I usually don't do that because I run stuff on HPCC, so I write log files. But what you can do is, what I do then on my laptop before I submit code to the HPCC is, I take a look at my graph to see if it makes sense. If I didn't do anything weird, the connections don't make sense. So if I, the previous graph that I showed you of our function, if I just add this little um, file writer here, and the directory where it's getting written to. Uh, if I add this, I can then go to my terminal and say tensorball log dir and give it this directory, head to my browser, and then I can also see the graph in my browser. I can interact with it. If you have more complex, let's say, networks, you can summarize uh, certain things. You can call something like, let's say, in a general adversarial network, you can have the generator and the discriminator separately, then you can expand, look into, into, into detail. You can interact with it and things like that. And as you can see, there are other things like histograms and scalars. You can monitor things uh, during training. But here, I use it most of the time just to take a look at my graph to see if it makes sense. And here, that is exactly the same graph that we defined, so everything is looking good here. It's the uh, weight uh, times multiplied by the input. Then we add the B to it and put it through the ReLU. And uh, yeah, so we can then also get multiple variables from the graph. Uh, here we can feed uh, multiple variable names. Here I used um, the UVA that I had in the graph. Uh, I told you that I usually, I maybe forgot because I wrote it in PowerPoint, but I usually use the uh, strings. And another concept that I want to mention here is 
there's a feed dict. And by that, we can feed val uh, values to the graph. So remember, x was a placeholder. And to give it a value, we have to kind of, there are multiple ways to feed data to the graph. But that's maybe the easiest, most common way via Python to define a dictionary and say we want to fit, uh, feed the value 3 to the x. And then it uh, does the computation. For instance, uh, here for the u, it would be 3 times 2. So we have 6. So it would give us back a 6. And for the v, we add a 1 to it. So it's 6 plus 1 is 6. And the ReLU just outputs x, the input. Because it's positive, it's also 7. So we can see here now we did actually the computation. Before, um, we just evaluated the variable b. We just uh, get the, got the value. And when we did that, it didn't run all of this kind of uh, stuff. It only runs stuff. If I ask for a, it runs a. But if I would, let's say, remove a, it would stop running here. So it doesn't run any unnecessary computations. And um, I think, yeah, now it will be a little bit, uh, yeah. OK, I so say I will talk about derivatives. I hope you like them. Uh, <laughs> so because that's a very important concept and why TensorFlow is kind of useful, because what I showed you before, you can easily do that in Python. Um, so let's maybe briefly uh, talk about uh, derivatives. So uh, here, for example, the derivative of a with respect to v, basically, if I change v a little bit, how much does it affect a? It would be, we can write it down here, I just wrote it down here. And I just will, in the next couple of slides, write these derivatives down for the other parts in my graph. So for each uh, kind of connection here, we can define a derivative. So how much does v change if we change uh, u a little, or if, uh, how does a little change in w affect u? So basically the derivatives. But in a real question, in a real application of neural networks, what we have, this is just a simple example. What we usually have a cost function or something that we want to minimize. And we want to uh, change our weight parameters to kind of minimize the cost function. So we compute the gradients, which is just a vector or, uh, of derivatives uh, or partial derivatives. And then we take an opposite step into the direction of the gradient to kind of minimize the function. Here, it's much simpler. It's just a simple graph. We don't have a cost function, but just to illustrate the point. So usually, in neural network, we want to change our parameters, for example, b and w, with uh, respect to something oh, we, uh, at the very end. And here, for example, to get the derivative of this function with respect to b here, we would use, for example, something like the chain rule, if we would write it down in paper, like in our calculus classes. So chain rule is basically if we have a nested function, function f that takes as input g, which takes as input x. And we want to know, for example, how much does change in x affect f. So we would basically just break it down into two parts. How much uh, is f affected by changing g? And then how much is uh, g affected by changing its function argument x? If we multiply that, we can basically compute the derivative of this whole function f with respect to uh, x. And this is kind of what you usually do in, on paper and calculus classes. But if you have a computation graph, I think it's much easier to illustrate this concept uh, using a computation graph. So here, for instance, um, to compute the derivative of uh, a with respect to b, so we can basically just multiply these two parts. So what we get then is um, here the derivative of v with respect to b times the derivative of a uh, with respect to v. So we basically say how much um, does v affect a and how much is v affected by b. So putting that together, that gives us how much uh, a is affected by a small change of b. So the derivative of that. And we can do the same thing here. So here it's a little bit uh, longer. We have uh, three terms if we expand it. So if we look at it again, how much does uh, w, the small change in w affect uh, a. And here we have this part and this part. And if we um, look at this again, so we, uh, we can expand, uh, I think uh, it's one too much here. I made a little typo over there. But it's basically uh, these uh, two terms here. We can expand that and compute that. And um, 
So if we give it now uh, uh, actual values, for example, if we, we just had our definitions here, and if we uh, feed actual values to our graph, a 3.0, for example, like earlier, we can walk through a simple example looking at how these uh, derivatives uh, look like. And here I just have uh, 3 times 2 is 6, 6 plus 1 is 7, and the ReLU gives us uh, 7 back. And the ReLU function, like mentioned earlier, is uh, returning x if something is positive and 0 otherwise. So the derivative of that would be here simply 1, and here 0, because if we... Uh, have x in and x out, basically, uh, how, do, how much does it affect what's the relationship between input and output? It's the relationship of 1, or basically the slope of the function would be 1. And that would be a derivative of 1, simply. And for the next one, we have, uh, where are we here? Ah, here, the question mark, it's pretty small. So how much does a change of b affect uh, the function v? And if we look at this, we can uh, simply use the sum rule. So here, basically, um, u becomes a, a constant, so, and the derivative of b is, again, 1. So we have 0 plus 1 equals 1, and we can do the same thing. It's kind of analogous. So here, uh, how much does u affect v? A small change. Here, uh, b is a constant because, because it becomes 0. This one is, again, 1. And, uh, yeah, a few more. Here, um, we have a multiplication. We have uh, u times x, so the derivative of that would be simply um, x. So we have uh, 3 here because the input is 3. Um, so if I have a function and I multiply it by x, what's the slope? It's basically x because x kind of scales the function. Um, the last one, and here these are easy now because we have computed all our intermediate steps. So we can just put it together, 1 times 1 is 1, and we can do the same thing here. We could put a 1 and 3 and 1 together, which is 3 times 1 points 1. <laughs> and yeah, that is basically just to understand computation graphs. Uh, it's maybe a little bit, well, it was a little bit of a tedious exercise here. Uh, but now getting back to TensorFlow to show you why this is uh, why TensorFlow is also useful among other things. Among uh, I mean, you, of course, it's fast. You can run it on a GPU, but uh, also kind of show you some of the convenience functions. For example, here, uh, let's say I have my uh, previous graph that I defined earlier. I can add more uh, nodes to it here. Now I want to, for example, do the same thing we did tediously by hand, compute the gradient or gradients, basically the derivative of A with respect to W and the derivative of A with respect to B. And we can just use, for example, the gradients function here. And if we feed it in the value 3, we get exactly the same values we get that we did uh, when we did this manually, uh, the 3 for W and the 1 for B. So that's cool. So TensorFlow can automatically do that so we don't have to analyze our networks or cost functions and write everything down uh, manually like we would, for example, do in NumPy. And um, just to kind of emphasize the point, uh, TensorFlow, there are two things usually when we write TensorFlow codes, code. There's the graph. We define a graph. And then we run or execute the graph in a kind of session here. Just a summary. So we have basically two steps, which is kind of different from Python, because in Python, when we do something, something like that, uh, u plus b, it gets evaluated immediately if it's getting run. Here, we really have to run it in a session. We have to initialize variables, feed a value to it, and then it runs the graph. And um, yeah, there was uh, previously a very simple example of a um, simple computation graph, but in real life, this is still a very simple example. It's just a multi-layer perceptron with one hidden unit. And that is, how, for example, how a forward pass would look like on a very simple data set. We have a handwritten digit, and we, it's, uh, I don't know, 28 times 28 pixels. We reshape it to a long vector, a column vector, and then we feed it uh, here. There would be basically the, an equal number to the input pixels. I have a very few notes here to just fit this onto the slide. But that would basically represent a very simple multilayer perceptron. We get an output. Then we compare to a class label, define a cost function, and want to minimize this cost function. And um, let's just assume we have a sigmoid activation here. 
uh, we compute again, this can be vectorized. It's just a, a, a vector times vector multiplication. And we have an activation function here, the sigmoid. And for the output layer, we have a, soft, a softmax activation, give us the probabilities of our output class labels. And I went through this exercise, so I uh, wrote all the derivatives down here in a little bit uh, more compact form. And actually, this is correct because I doubt, uh, I assume this is correct because I double checked. I use the um, TensorFlow gradients function. I got the same results, so I think I did everything correctly here. But as you can see, it's very tedious. You do all the math, and uh, let's say if you use NumPy, <laughs> implement a neural network in NumPy, you have to kind of compute your derivatives and things like that. But in TensorFlow, it's actually much more convenient. There are a lot of functions that can help us with this. Um, for example, if I wouldn't use uh, TensorFlow, this is actually in TensorFlow, but I could do the same thing in NumPy. I, everything I had on the previous slides, I brought it down here, like the sigma h, the error terms, and things like that. Then I compute the gradients. I have to kind of define everything by hand. That is a very tedious approach. But in TensorFlow, um, so here, one last thing. In the end, I put a train operation to minimize the cost function. I have all my things that I want to update, I group them together, so I can just run this uh, as one kind of node in the graph, which I can do here in the session. If I call train, it will uh, run through the updates. But again, it's still very tedious. So a more convenient approach would be just to use the gradients function that we talked about earlier. I can say, okay, um, compute the gradients for me here and here, and then I just assign, use assign to update my previous weights and biases to minimize the cost function. I can do that. It is slightly more convenient, but it's still very like tedious to define all the gradients manually. So what's most convenient in TensorFlow is to use uh, something. That's why it's maybe called deep learning library rather than linear algebra library, because they have a lot of cool stuff in there, like uh, TF train gradient descent optimizer. They have many more optimizers in there, Adam and things like that. Uh, here we just give it a cost function like here, and that's about it. It will figure out all the connections in our graph and minimize uh, the cost function with respect to the weights. We don't have to bother writing down gradients and updating man, uh, variables manually. It will do that for us. And then again, we can run session.run train, and yeah, that's about it. That's as convenient as it can get, I think. And just to talk about one more thing, um, TensorFlow, TensorFlow layers. So TensorFlow layers is, um, I would say, rather new. I think it was added in TensorFlow 1.1 or 1.2, like in May or something like that. And they make things even more convenient. So just to give you an overview, this is a screenshot from the Dev Summit, um, TensorFlow Dev Summit. I think it was earlier this year. And here's a summary of the different things, how TensorFlow is organized or going to be organized. So Previously, in the previous slides, we used the Python front end, uh, wrote kind of low-level TensorFlow code, but there's also something on top of it, layers, that um, predefines uh, common layers like a fully connected layer, convolutional layer for 2D convolutions and things like that, or an LSTM and things like that. And um, on top of that, it's, I think, currently uh, still in progress, but they're also adding uh, Keras to TensorFlow directly, I think in a cleaned up version, like because the Keras right now is um, written, was written to support Tiano, TensorFlow was added, and I think MXNet was added. Here they use, I think, layers to implement this more cleanly or elegantly in TensorFlow. And they also have an estimator API, which is very similar to what we know from scikit-learn. It's not quite like scikit-learn, but it has something similar to a train and predict function. And on top of that, I think they included some in the 1.3 release when I saw it correctly, like Kant estimators, for example, a linear classifier, a multi layer perceptron, and things like that, so that we don't have to construct them manually. They are also, you can think of them like in scikit learn logistic regression or something, or SVM or something like that. And yeah, that makes things even more convenient. For my experiments, I usually um, use the, just the Python front end because we do a lot of custom stuff. But um, these are kind of nice additions to it. And just to give you an idea how this uh, TensorFlow um, layers thing looks like, so here I just wrote a fully connected uh, layer myself. 
So before that, I had to define that myself, and then I used that in the graph to kind of, because uh, I don't want to write a whole, a, whole, a whole fully connected function all over again. In the graph, I can just define a function and then call it to create a fully connected layer in my graph. And in, let's say, TensorFlow layers, we can just use the dense uh, function here. So it's TF layers and dense, it's equivalent to my fully connected before. So it makes things much more convenient. And the same thing is true for convolutional neural layers. Okay, so and there are many more uh, ways to feed things into our graph. And I just talked about placeholders, which is just using um, Python or in Python. We uh, have a session.run and give it a Python dictionary with things and it feeds stuff from uh, the Python session into the TensorFlow graph. There are many more or uh, more efficient ways if um, you want to really optimize your neural networks. Um, there are uh, the TF records files. It's uh, based on protobuf, a protocol buffer by, developed by Google, a binary format, which is kind of efficient for storing data and uh, let's say weight parameters and models. And also they have queues, which are very useful if we work with uh, large data sets. One issue is usually that the GPU waits, uh, it does an operation, and then it waits for the next, let's say, data record or batch of images. It's kind of not taking full advantage. It, it's uh, kind of starving the GPU of data or things like that. And having a queue, it kind of queues up things in the cache, and then it run, or it's basically directly fed into TensorFlow without using the feed dict in Python, which makes things even more efficient. I played around with that, but usually I use HDF5, uh, with Python uh, feed dicts because yeah, time is not that much of an issue if it runs, let's say, in one day or one and a half days because I have a lot of things to run. And I use usually these formats because they are more, because I don't only use TensorFlow, I use other tools, and these are more like a common language that I can also use in other tools. And I just wanted to mention, though, the other options. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, we are, I think we don't have that much time left. So I looked at my abstract and I saw that I mentioned um, general adversarial networks. And when I was preparing my talk, uh, was it uh, Monday or Tuesday, I realized uh, I was really running out of, let's say, I'm at site 51, uh, 58. I wasn't really having time for that. And yeah, I apologize if I didn't kind of fully uh, cover everything I promised I would cover. But I have this um, yeah GitHub uh, repository where I put a general adversarial networks in there. You can check it out. It's, uh, I haven't ad added much comments, but uh, if you want to look at it, it's there. And yeah, to maybe um, wrap it up, I, uh, there are some additional free resources. I think a great book is the Deep Learning book by uh, Ian Goodfellow, Joshua Benjo, and Aaron Kurville. And this is free online. The manuscript is free. You can read it for free. There's a paperback that you can buy. But it's a really great book. I would maybe check it out online if you like it, if you want to learn more about deep learning. And if you like it, you can then get the textbook in paper form or things like that. There's, of course, the TensorFlow documentation. I think it's still the best documentation. There are a lot of um, resources out there, but I think they got a little bit outdated over time because TensorFlow is evolving. This is the official resource. They have a lot of tutorials. I would, I would say start there because um, everything is kind of up to date and very complete and very thorough. And yeah, I also was, uh, it is a busy summer. I am writing on three papers in parallel to uh, getting submitted tomorrow. But if I have time, I also sometimes write on this book. And um, it's not really like about TensorFlow. It's about deep learning, explaining deep learning. But at uh, the end of each chapter, there will be, a, let's say, a lab section where I have TensorFlow examples that I explain a little bit to kind of um, make the deep learning part more practical. And yeah, I'm uploading right now. I only have a bunch of appendices, but I'll upload chapters also as, let's say, a draft version on GitHub. So it will be free and things like that. And yeah, another announcement, another book uh, was, I said, a busy summer. I didn't do the cover. They said um, it's a new series. It, they call it Expert Insight, and they will all have author images on the cover. So I couldn't do much about it. I hope you. <laughs> You can, I mean, get the digital version. You don't have to watch it or well, see it on the bookshelf if it's annoying. But uh, anyway, so yeah, I was also working on the second edition of 
my machine learning book, which came out in 2015. Uh, it was actually, we started in February and each chapter got a slight overhaul. I addressed uh, all the reader feedback, added more explanations, fixed all the nasty typos that came up during layout because you had to, to wor uh, write things in Word, they converted to PDF and then a lot of typos crept in. Maybe I also made some typos, I mean, I'm only human, but um, we tried to remove all the typos in the previous version, added more explanations. I overhauled the figures, which I back then just quickly did in PowerPoint. I had to write one chapter a week. I think it was pretty rough. Um, so this time I had a little bit more time to make the figures nicer. And this is actually one of my collaborators, Vahid Miralili. Uh, with him, I'm working on the biometrics project. And also he volunteered to contribute to new chapters on uh, TensorFlow and uh, convolutional neural networks. <coughs> and uh, recurrent neural networks, so it will be new chapters. I think it will probably be 550 or 600 pages. And we are currently working. I was just checking uh, drafts yesterday, so it's still in progress, but it will be out maybe in two weeks or, or something like that. And yeah, with that, now to maybe just the resources. So again, slides are here. I have a, a GitHub repository with all the code snippets I had in here. Thing you can also just still uh, you can just execute them. It will all run fine, I hope. Um, and yeah, now then maybe for the maybe I have five more minutes for questions. So um, first of all, thank you for um, coming. And it has been a hell of a week, a lot of work, and but it was uh, fun. I'm glad that I'm here and I enjoyed it and was talking about a fresh topic I've never talked before. So I hope it was kind of not too weird. I hope. Uh, you liked it, and yeah, thank you. We have some time for questions. Uh, hopefully, you'll share this deck with us, and then we can upload it to our uh, mm -hmm. GitHub. Uh, sure, repo. and uh, it's already online, so you can either download it from there. I can give you a PowerPoint, whatever you prefer. And, and uh, thank you again, uh, Sebastian. And I, I want to say that uh, I'm looking for artwork on top of my mantle, so I'm definitely going to use that book cover. Uh, <laughs> but I'll have to convince my wife first. <laughs> but any questions? Yes, Chuck. I have a really quick, simple, dumb kind of question about the computational graphs. On the um, init, the arrow was pointing towards the init from the node rather than the other way. And why, why is that? Um, because it depends on the init? I think, yeah, I also, um, I know what you mean. It's like a circle um, and it's going the from the node. Mm -hmm. uh, I will just go to the slide quickly, then we can. Yeah. So you mean this part? Yeah. Honestly, I, I don't know. Okay. I mean, it works fine. I think it's um, just saying um, this has an init function. I honestly, okay. I also that looks a little bit confusing and weird, right? I know if you have multiple init functions, you can add multiple inits. Uh, for example, that's one reason why I put my init. Uh, Put it here because. Surely, hmm? this is dependent upon. Yeah, 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 that's a good point. Yeah, but then the arrow should be the other way around, maybe. But yeah, but anyway, that's, yeah. thanks. So, for example, if I wouldn't uh, put the init up here, but I would. Um, often, you see it also in tutorials. You can take this part, and you can call it um, in the initializer here in the session run. Put this part here, and then if you run the session multiple times. And then you look at the graph, you will see then, for example, it has multiple of the, these inits. So I think it's just, yeah, like you said, a dependency, but I'm not sure why the arrow is going this way or not the other way, but, you know. Actually, it wouldn't even need an arrow, I think. It would just be a line would be fine, but I didn't design this, so <laughs> sorry. Question right here. Hi, Sebastian. Uh, a question about the, the sort of the canned models that you mm -hmm. that you mentioned as the topmost layer of those available features available that mm -hmm. So do these come pre-parameterized with the set of networks? Uh, and if so, do uh, deep, deep networks parameterize change in a certain domain work well for a predictive problem in another domain? Or? Um, as far as I can tell, there are some models um, by Google, like Inception, they are pre-trained networks. But I think this is different. I honestly haven't used the CAN estimators. They just came out like two weeks ago in 1.3. But it looked to me they are more similar to scikit-learn you, uh, it's not a pre-fitted thing. Let's say it's an SVM like in scikit-learn. You give it your data and learns from your data. It's not like pre-trained or things like that. It's more like um, 
for common things, let's say linear regression, logistic regression, linear SVM, you don't need to reinvent the wheel and uh, implement it yourself. Someone already did it in a nice way, and it, it's just like a predefined, let's say, um, estimator. Ben, what are adversarial networks, and why are they interesting? So yeah, general adversarial networks. Um, so they are basically you can do uh, you can use that basically to build a better uh, predictor or discriminator, like a classifier. Or you can generate new training data sets or training samples. So you basically have a classifier to classify whether something is, a, let's say, a generated image or a real image of, let's say, a handwritten digit. And then you have an adversary that generates something and wants, it wants the classifier to think what it generated is real, like a real handwritten digit. And the discriminator becomes better at recognizing fake images, but then the ad, so the generator has to become better to fool it to make better generated images. So you can basically generate new images with that um, of everything. It's really hard to train though. Handwritten digits is fine, but everything beyond that is, I think, still experimental. It takes a lot of trial and error to get the right balance because the cost function has two terms, the discriminator and the generator. But you can also improve basically a classifier by generating new things and making it more robust to things like that. In our project, we used something similar. I don't want to talk to it too much, but uh, for example, we want to um, change an image in a way to hide information from the image, for example. And we don't use general adversarial networks like they are. We have some something else, but yeah, we'll, uh, once the paper is out, I'll talk more about that maybe, maybe the next time I come here. Um, yeah. In the back. Oh, yeah. Ah, uh, sorry. Uh, you mean this one down here? Uh, here, that just means uh, element-wise uh, multiplication. Uh, uh, if you have a number of elements, it's just like the star in Python, like the asterisk. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit confusing here. Uh, so yeah, Epoch, um, basically if we have a training data set, that would be one pass over the training data set. So if we have, let's say, 1,000 samples, it would mean we iterate uh, over the 1,000 samples. It's one iteration of the whole training set. Question in the front. So for the real loop function, how does TensorFlow evaluate the derivative at the kink? That's a good question. Uh, the question is how... Um, TensorFlow evaluates the derivative at the kink of the ReLU function. I'm actually not sure how exactly it's implemented in TensorFlow. So it might just set it to zero. Yeah, could be. So basically, my question is more, if I had a custom step function, mm -hmm. so it's not a built-in function, um, and I ask it to take a derivative and it happens to be at what normally is an undervaluable point, mm -hmm. what value would it assign? When I take when I use the gradient function, I've never tried that to be honest. So for the ReLU, I use the uh, function that's already already implemented. Um, the question was uh, how uh, would you define your own stepwise uh, function? Uh, I've not I haven't tried that. Uh, how gradients works with that? I'm pretty sure if you look it up, there's one way someone tried that before. Uh, although no, I did. I think I did a, a leaky ReLU once. I have to look at this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so how does the network implement not uh, like a sample weights, like how sample has a different weights, how does that come into the neural network? Each sample has a different weight. You mean not the uh, weight parameters, but you, you mean like the importance of each um, yeah. sample. I think you can just have another vector in your network. If you have your network, uh, let's say just some code, you add another vector to it, you do an element uh, element wise multiplication of maybe your predictions. You let's say you predict values, you multiply it with your weight, and then it gets taken care of in the cost function because then uh, if you have a wrong prediction, if you multiply it by something positive, it is more wrong, you know. So any other questions?
Great. Oh, one in the back. One more. Robbie. He's trying to start wars. <laughs> yeah, so also, uh, like I said in the beginning, I mean, I just uh, checked out TensorFlow. I really liked it. The question was how it does compare to, let's say, Theano, but there's also, let's say, PyTorch, and um, how it makes things easier. I think, honestly, what I like about it is um, there's nothing I really can say that is much better or different, but... It's such a common tool. There's a, a large community, uh, active mailing list, a lot of documentation. A lot of people use it. It's like um, like scikit-learn. It's a nicely programmed, but uh, through the large community, you have a lot of resources. If you need something, it's easy to find. Um, it's not much different from Theano, I would say. I think it maybe makes a difference if you put stuff into production. I'm just doing research. I don't worry about it, but... They, for example, have uh, functions that help you to run the code on, let's say, a smartphone, to port it to the smartphone. And also for distributed computing, if I usually just run my code on one GPU, but they have uh, distributed computing that you can utilize multiple GPUs for one neural network. You have to do some, something extra. You have to define which operation runs on which GPU. But, yeah, I'm not sure if you can do that in Theano. But these are things maybe more like for production or things like that. But I think for basic stuff, it's not much better. And I'm also surprised why it's so much more popular than Theano. Maybe because Google? I don't know. <laughs> so with that, uh, I welcome everybody to stick around a little bit longer, network, interact. And don't forget that there are people uh, uh, hiring. So definitely reach out to them. And so let's all give uh, Sebastian another round of applause. Thank you.